Hello and welcome to the big picture. Torn between Russia and the European Union, Ukraine is going through its most tumultuous phase in its post-Soviet Union history. It has in the last couple of weeks witnessed a change in government, its absconding president accused of mass murder and violent clashes resulting in deaths and destruction. Meanwhile, the situation is being termed as dangerous in many quarters as Russia and the United States are seen to be locked in a fierce diplomatic battle. Fears of escalation into a military war is being expressed as Russian troops have been mobilized and NATO is indulging in saber rattling. The British Foreign Secretary had described the situation as the biggest crisis in the Europe of the 21st century. What does the Ukraine crisis mean to the rest of the world? Is it the beginning of another Cold War as some analysts suggest? Or is there a way out of this crisis? We will discuss all this today with some of the most experienced panelists. I have with me Ronan Sain, former Indian ambassador to the United States as well as Russia, Commodore retired C. Uday Baska, senior fellow at the National Maritime Foundation and a defense analyst, Professor Gulshan Sachdeva of the Center for European Studies in the JNU, and Nandan Unnikrishnan, senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, and also a senior foreign affairs journalist who has worked in Moscow. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Ronan Sain, would you, dis would you agree with the... Uh, British Foreign Secretary that is the biggest crisis in Europe in the 21st century? It could become the biggest crisis, but uh, in the sense of, uh, but this is a part of what has been, you know, there have been tensions uh, right from the breakup of the Soviet Union. Right. It has been manifested time and time again. And there, uh, as far as Russia is concerned uh, and Ukraine is concerned, you know, this has meant after the breakup of the Soviet Union, there have been constant efforts to push Russia uh, in, into and go not only the all of East Europe, which has become NATO members and EU members, but also go into the territory of the former Soviet Union. Right. In uh, Baltic states were a state, I mean, a case apart. But then you had this in Georgia, uh, and it came to a head in, two, uh, I think, 2008. 2008. Uh, then uh, you had that Moldova, right, and now Ukraine. I mean, which is the most important of all of that. So it's it is there have been from the Russian point of view a series of provocations, and it's come to a head. And so, so th these are these provocations that like Russia sees it is clearly a making of the West is led by the United States. Would you agree with that? Well, I'd, uh, certainly. I mean, from their perspective, certainly. And if you really look at it, uh, if you look at it uh, objectively. I mean, you've had a, a fair number of, I mean, for instance, the EU association agreement. It was not just about economic cooperation, right. but it covered, and not only political coordination, but it covered uh, uh, foreign policy and defense and security issues also. And there are clauses in that, including uh, uh, collaboration uh, in terms of the common security and defense policy of the European Union. So there are many aspects. And it's very clear, and it, I think it's, uh, it, it need not have developed into such a crisis if some fundamental concerns of Russia and legitimate interests of Russia had been taken on board. So, uh, Professor Gulchen Sachdeva, this, uh, very interestingly, if some analysts see a parallel between what is happening between Russia and Ukraine with India and Pakistan. Would you see that kind of a parallel? <laughs> well, I mean... Uh... Well, in a sense, some people in Russia might even say that this is Russia's Pakistan, Ukraine. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, so obviously, if somebody is really thinking that if uh, Russia is going to engage itself in Russia's Pakistan, I think that's not going to happen so easily because they know what the things are at stake. But, you know, as uh, the situation is developing rapidly and uh, many things are at stake, uh, it's at stake for uh, Russia, for European Union and for the whole global balance of power. Right. Because, uh, you know, this is uh, such a strategically important country between Russia and Europe. And through this, it's going to be determined in future, whatever the outcome of this Ukraine crisis is, what Russia's future is going to be there as a, as a you know, major part. Right. At the same time, the whole, uh, the European Union's intention of playing an important role in global affairs, now that also would be determined by what is going to happen here. At the same time, if they cooperate here, I mean, saying West and Russia in the year, in the months, in the days to come, or if the standoff continues, 
Now that is also going to determine not just what is going to happen here in Ukraine, but so many other hotspots. Because so far, for the last two three years, Russia, after that reset policy or even before that, it has been cooperating with the West, particularly with the United States, whether it's in Afghanistan or in uh, you know so many other in Syria, Syria and many other places. But if something goes wrong here. I think many of the things are going to change uh, dramatically in many other places. So in that sense, many things are at stake, and I hope that uh, you know uh, everybody understands. But why Russia has taken this particular stand, which has taken in the last few days now, because even when in fact you know things were going wrong, when all the demonstrations were happening in uh, in Kiev, um, and even when uh, you know the whole the EU brokered agreement on 21st February happened. Even Russia had certain reservations, but it continued to support that. But within within 24 hours, even that particular agreement also just was thrown away. I mean, that's why perhaps the Russia felt that even in the backyard of Russia, particularly in a country like Ukraine, I mean, it can't be pushed around. So it has to really assert its uh, interest. It 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 also has to show both as a major power, as a major uh, defense power. at the same time the ethnic connection so it's going to use all these leverages now but ultimately i think russia doesn't want to perhaps go too far perhaps to fight there or going into you know uh, you know those kind of uh, all kind of scenarios which many people have posed but at the same time it has a legitimate interest here and it want to show to the world that yes it can defend its interest when it comes to particular in the post soviet space defend the uh, uday baskar in the process of defending is itself uh, Russia, you know, there are there are now uh, analysts and reports appearing that you know a warlike situation is developing there. Do you see things escalating to that extent in the near future? You know, personally, Girish, I do not see this escalating to the equivalent of a conventional war. And the reason I'm saying that is that there is no doubt that. Moscow has definitely taken a certain assertive position its troops are already there but whether this would result in quote unquote ukraine resisting the advances of moscow militarily is a very unlikely scenario mainly because there is such an asymmetry between russia's military capability and that which ukraine can bring to bear as far as the but external impetus is concerned exactly there it is very unlikely again that either the european union or for that matter the united states would actually commit to any kind of military assistance so as i foresee it it's going to be very uneasy very tense and much of the contestation will play out between the so called pro russian forces within ukraine particularly in a place like crimea and the so called anti russia anti moscow those who have been seen to be part of again the liberal camp as far as ukraine's internal dynamic is concerned but there is no doubt that moscow has raised the ante and now we have to see what will be the response both in terms of the united states and the allies and how this will be actually reviewed in the united nations security council where both china and russia have a very very major role in terms of the consensus considering that russia is now a, one of the interested parties in maintaining what it sees as its own backyard or its area of interest in relation to ukraine and the so called pro western forces in that country okay uh, nandan you know there are two, there are two ways of looking at this whole thing one is looking from the russian point of view the other from the us and the european point of view some people feel that it is you know that uh, Putin is very uncomfortable with having a democratic country on its border so you know he is creating these problems on the other hand the other view is that it is the US and the European forces which are creating these problems because they want Ukraine is a very if Ukraine becomes part of European Union then the whole scenario changes how would you look at it well russia has had finland on its border for many many years and that's a democratic country and they have been quite all right ukraine being part of the soviet union yeah. in the past but you know, coming to ukraine there are it's specific, their legacy their past is what matters there are specific linkages with ukraine after all there is no doubt about it that the origins of russia as a nation as a state are seen in kiev right. kiev and rus uh if you go further back in history to 998 prince uh, vladimir 
takes Christianity, the oath of Christianity, he does it in Crimea. So you still have the Cathedral of St. Vladimir there, which is the actual origins of the Russian state, Russian civilization, the Orthodox uh, Church. So the linkages are very strong. Right. But over and above that, Crimea is traditionally been a, a place of strategic importance for the Soviet Union, and of course after that as a successor continuator state for Russia. Uh, the basing of the Russian fleet there is very important. Over and above that, again, there are strong economic interests, strong political interests that Russia and Ukraine shared till recently. Now, if, as Ambassador Sen said, that uh, Russia's legitimate interests were addressed and Russia was assured that they would be protected, I don't think you would have had any of this. But right now, what is the situation? I mean, if you look at it objectively, you had an elected president who signed an agreement in the presence of the foreign ministers of Germany, France and Poland, right. who also signed on that agreement. Incidentally, the Russians didn't sign on it. Have that agreement torn to pieces within half an hour when you go out onto the streets by a mob of protesters right. and nobody is objecting to it. So a legitimate president is forced to flee. Whether he's a murderer or not is a different question, but the point is he was an elected president. And today you have in part a set of people who have not been elected, who have who are, no, who are, who are seen as U.S. stooges. No, I don't know whether they're U.S. stooges or not. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> but effectively, the fact is, this is tantamount to a coup. So it would be right for anybody, including the Russians, to say, let there be a legitimate power in Kiev. Then we can see how we'll deal with it. Okay, well, Ambassador Sin, uh, you know. NATO is also making some noises and things like that. Uh, uh, Uday Bhaskar feels that, you know, they're leading to a situation of a war with, you know, the, the Western forces lending support militarily to the Ukraine is a remote possibility, he feels. Do you also feel so? Absolutely. I don't think anybody is interested in escalating this into a hot conflict. And, uh, uh, but, you know, talking of, uh, uh, you know, taking off what uh, Nandan was saying, if you look at What's going to happen? You know, what lies ahead? Yes. What lies ahead is one is that uh, G7 has taken some action. They have condemned it and they have said that they're not going to have Sochi. The United, uh, United Nations Security Council has met twice without any conclusion. They are unlikely to have a resolution looking forward because not only because of Russia, but because of uh, China's position. China's, role. China's position is going to be very, very important. Now, what has to, China now reports are coming. I don't know how far we can rely on. I mean, we can rely on those reports saying that China is supporting Russia. But there are also reports saying that you know China is doing a balancing act. No, but actually, let's go by. You know, I know that Sergey Lavrov had talked to his counterpart, right. Foreign Minister Wang, right uh, today. But what did they say actually? They said that they condemn extreme violence. Right. They did not say by whom. Exactly. Now, according to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, violence was used by both sides. Right. That is, the protesters, including live bullets, fire bombs, etc., occupying government buildings. So, violence was used by both sides. So, they condemn extremist right. violence. Then they advocate a solution by uh, peaceful solution. But, and they also say that there should be uh, the all the peoples of Ukraine, their rights should be taken into consideration. All the people. That means, obviously, because there have been series of provocative right. actions, not just by, you know, the way the form, the government was ousted or formed, let us say. And you Though it's ineffective. It's, it's non-functional government. But if you really look at it, you know, series of other actions, you know, like repealing the uh, law on uh, languages, you know, doing away with Russian and series of other pro questioning the, uh, you know, the status of uh, the Crimea. Now, if you really have to, in a sense, if, if you went ahead with dialogue and Putin's initial approach was very cautious, very restrained, and where he sent someone to negotiate a person who was known to be a moderate. So right now, without going into those details, for instance, they also, China said the principles of non-interference. Non-interference doesn't mean just moving your forces. Non-interference means don't try to Provoke. You know, the government, don't try to <laughs> which is all been wife to set up a new government, which is all you don't know who is going to get what post. So, you know, interference uh, in that way, it has uh, many meanings. So, 
I think basically I don't think it's going to be debated but right now there is a need for an early solution because you're heading for a referendum end of this month. If you're going to have elections, you can't have elections in territories which are not under your control. Right. So, and you have a huge, huge economic problem there. Right. So you and have I, to take decisions. Ukraine now. is going through a huge financial I, I economic think, crisis. I think people will, even, even cold warriors, you know, some former cold warriors, they have taken the position that, look, one is without taking Russia on board, there's going to be no solution, number one. Number two is that you have to uh, decide on certain things. That means certainly have an assurance that there's going to be no expansion of NATO eastwards in Ukraine. Okay, uh, Professor Gulshan. Um, there are, there's a lot of diplomatic arm twisting being tried. You know, G8, G8 meeting in June, US is, US is say, US, France, Britain, and now I'm told even Canada also saying that we will boycott that meeting and things like that. This kind of arm twisting, is it going to help in any way in, uh, in bringing Russia onto the table as far as US is concerned? No, I think what uh, at the moment uh, West is saying, because they didn't really expect that this is going to happen, and they didn't have any plan of this. They is who? I mean the West, West, US as well as the Europe. So one, this uh, the move which has uh, now taken by Russia. So suddenly they have to come out with something to say. But you know whether they are going to cancel G8 meeting, but Russians are not going to care much whether this G8 meeting is going to take place or not. Because of that, they are not going to come under pressure. But the crucial question is, really, what what are the things at stake at the moment? Right. For Russia. I mean, what are their objectives? I don't think they really want to capture Crimea or they want to divide, uh, say, Ukraine. I think their interests are that basically, you know, what is happening in U U uh, Ukraine or what was happening in the last couple of uh, months. Now, their assets, I mean, their military assets within uh, Ukraine at the same time, the you know, certain areas, particularly in the east and uh, those areas where Russian speaking are in majority. Right. So those should be protected. At the same time, uh, in the end, you know, they have their own larger project of Eurasian project. So they also bring, they also want to bring, you know, uh, Ukraine into the Eurasian, uh, the whole uh, project. So if they really want to be on the, uh, in, in the, in the, that particular fight with the Ukraine, then obviously that's not going to happen. Now objectives, if you look at from the other side, the West side and the European side, you now what they want an independent, sovereign, united Ukraine, uh, built by a free and fair elections, rule of law, and somehow linked with the European EU institutions as well as with NATO institutions. Now, how do they meet? So this is what I think is going to be the tussle between the West as well as uh, with Russia uh, and between Russia. So how wh this is what the diplomatic what about wh what about uh, what about the economic aspect of this? Whole oh, thing? it's very serious because uh, I think it's already been mentioned. I mean, uh, now the way. Uh, the, in the last few months. Because Ukraine depends on Russia for, for its gas and it oil. It depends for gas at the same time. I mean, they, they are going to default. I mean, the new administration itself right. has mentioned that they need at least 35 billion for the next two so years. So can, can they get that from the Western powers? Well, it's not that easy because That's first right. thing is that Europe, I mean, within all their crises, they can't really afford that much money exactly. to Ukraine. At right. the same, I mean, what they're trying, I mean, through the IMF and something, I mean, that's going to take time. And I don't think the big money is going to come. And even if money is going to come from the IMF and those institutions, it's going to come with all kind of conditionalities. Right. Now, Russia had already committed 15 billion to Ukraine. So that's what I'm saying. The solution for Ukraine has to be found working together. So both of them have to make some compromises because Russia also want to bring back Basically, this whole area, the whole post-Soviet space, this is the, you know, Putin's pet project. Absolutely. He wants to have this project successful. And if Ukraine is out of that, his whole scenario is basically gone. So in that sense, Russia also would like Ukraine within that larger project. And for that, I think they will basically uh, somehow will have to negotiate with the Europeans. And, and the stabilization of the Europe will have to, uh, stabilization of Ukraine will have to come working together with Russia as well as with Absolutely. any other Russia cannot, Russia cannot be... Uh, Kept aside, uh, Uday Baskar, one of the one of the positive things which have been ha which are happening in the last few uh, in the last day or two is that at least you know, in, in, though there are a lo lot of reports of these escalating tensions and things like that, but Putin and uh, Obama are still talking to each other. Yeah, absolutely. You know, today if you see one of the reports seems to suggest that they had a very extensive chat, a 90 minute which went to almost over an hour. 
Yes. And more interestingly, from Washington, a very detailed uh, release was made available to the media, meaning that they are trying to give a sense about what is the level of dialogue between Mr. Obama and Mr. Putin. So right. I think that is perhaps a positive sign that in any tense situation, as long as there is some attempt at trying to keep the lines of communication open, that is a positive. Concurrently, the sense I get is that even within the European Union, given the fact that there was an initiative in February in which the Polish foreign minister had taken a fairly active role, that there would also be an attempt at the level of the European Union and perhaps even by individual countries to reach out to Moscow and see, as Ambassador Sen was saying, that can there be somebody who could play this role of being able to negotiate between the two sides. One would have to be something to reconcile the domestic politics within Ukraine. And this is not new. I mean, if you look at the debate within Ukraine, even from the time when it became the equivalent of a post-Soviet state, and you had Kiev, you could see that there was a contestation between what was then perceived as the pro-Russia lobby, the pro-Moscow lobby, which because of the Soviet inheritance had a certain leverage. And the last decade has seen two levels, I would say, two undercurrents. One is pro-Russia and the so-called nationalist Ukrainian. The second within the domestic calculus of Ukraine is the so-called orientation towards the West, right. the degree to which Ukraine would associate itself with the West in terms of its economy trade and those who belong to the earlier camp who felt that their dependence had to be on Russia, Russia or Moscow. So I think that balance has to be struck. I mean, we all agree now, we are all saying the same thing, that Kiev cannot buck Moscow. But at the same time, Moscow must allow Kiev to be able to have some degree of linkages as far as the European Union is concerned. So I think the dialogue between Mr. Putin and Mr. Obama is a positive. Whether it will lead to a resolution or a better management is still a bit of a question mark because there are also, I think I was quite struck by Ambassador Sen's reference to Cold War warriors. Right. You can already hear some people saying that this is a litmus test right. for Mr. Obama and whether or not he'll be able to draw a line as far as Moscow is concerned. Now that, I think, particular dynamic will continue. But I still remain, as I said, cautiously optimistic that it will not move to a hot war or military escalation. Okay. And that there would be some attempt at trying to resolve this. Because the symbolism of Ukraine cannot be, I think, ignored. It is the largest state in Europe. I mean, if you just look at the entire European geography, its area is the largest. Right. So there is that symbolism both for, I would say, the EU and Europe, right. and on the other hand for Moscow, that you can't allow Ukraine to, as Putin's greatest fear of Mr. Putin's is, that it's slipping out of Moscow's right. sphere Good of influence. To. So okay. I think this balance would have to be arrived at. It's complex, but it's also, I think, a reflection of a certain trend that we see in many parts of the world now. Okay. Girish? Nandan? Uh, Nandan, negotiate. He's talking about negotiator. Where does India stand in all these things? Where, what, is the, what, is the, what are the dilemmas which India is facing? You think that India needs to take a stand here either way? No, I don't think so. I don't think India is a player in this particular uh, situation. India is not a player at all. And uh, therefore, I don't think India has any uh, role or advice to offer in this particular case. We should watch. We have a close relationship with both uh, Russia and Ukraine. Of course, our strategic states with uh, stakes with Russia are far, far greater. But uh, we should just watch and hope that uh, this situation is resolved amicably, keeping in mind, as all the other speakers have pointed out, the interests of all parties involved. Sir, Mr. Ronan Sen, you think India should keep away and just wait and watch? Yes, at the moment, I don't I think we'll have to see because the situation is not very clear because you don't, as I said, you don't have an effective government in the Ukraine itself. So we should all hope what that the, the situation what, stabilizes. What are the, what are the, what are the uh, you know, uh, interests involved in, in Ukraine, for instance, for, as far as India is concerned? Well, it's a major country. We it have has natural about, resources. Yeah, about, not just naturally. We have, you know, it's a market for our pharmaceuticals. Our trade is not that big, but I think it's 3.2 or 3.3 .3 billion dollars, but it's growing. Uh, it, it is, you know, we could have had uh, significant, I mean, uh, uh, trade and uh, cooperation, number of other areas. Uh, but 
But that is all of secondary consideration. Your Ukraine is very strategically located. Uh, it's a very large country, uh, as been just pointed out. It's also has got many historic, cultural, civilizational links with uh, Russia. But also, uh, you know, over a period of time, I think Russia also has to accept, expect, and but uh, expect certain things, but also accept. Uh, recognize and accept the separate identity of Ukraine and also its yearning so you think for that independence. That has still, to be accepted. There is still that, that problem as far as Russia is concerned about the identity of Ukraine. It still feels that it is backyard. Is, it, that, is that why these problems? No, them? it doesn't. I don't think so. I think that you have to, you cannot divorce history for it also because we are talking of other aspects of identity. But there is history and you find the strategic location. So it cannot allow, I think, you know, at the moment, uh, it to completely be, uh, in its view, in its view, you know, subverted or co-opted uh, by a group of people. And we don't even know. Some of the people there, I said there's no effective government. They are called a minority. They are called an extremist fringe. But they're not that much of an extremist fringe. In fact, they are in the, uh, those same groups are in the, uh, uh, defense uh, ministry, they are in, in the justice ministry, they are in the prosecutor's office, these are important security officers there. So, and they are armed people going around, people with arms. Under this EU agreement, they were all supposed to disarm. Right. You have the huge numbers of people with arms, and not arms of just small arms, you know, <laughs> other, other varieties of arms. So we have to get, the immediate task is to get the situation under control, have a, at least a pretense, a, a minimum, you know, some kind of government to handle the transition period between now and the elections. So, you know, who, who is the key here? The U.S. and Russia will have to deal with this ultimately if the if situation has to come under control. Who are the key players? I think ultimately. the U.S. and, uh, US and uh, Russia, that's absolutely because the EU can play some role. But ultimately, these are the two big players which are going to determine. But, you know, ultimately now, it's becoming quite clear that what they really need is the only way out I can see is that they have to go back somehow to the 21st February agreement which was already brokered by EU and accepted by more or less by others. Now, whether uh, going to be with this president or other president, something, no, but, but somehow that time if, if, if Ukraine became, becomes part of the EU, what is the, Russia, Russia is going to have huge problems. But first thing is that Ukraine yeah. cannot become part of EU at all, because even on the case of, because they, they, were, not ne they were not negotiating uh, membership agreement, they were just negotiating, negotiating on the association agreement right. and the free trade agreement. Right. Even on association agreement, yesterday there was a press conference by a European uh, uh, commission, uh, you know, uh, the spokesperson, and in which he was not committed even because, you know, many leaders, new leaders within the Ukraine, they were saying that we should sign this uh, association agreement as soon as possible. But then many questions are asked whether you can sign this agreement now with this government, which doesn't have that kind of legitimacy. So they, they are even, even for the association agreement, I think the EU somehow will have to wait for some kind of you know, the government which will no. come in the months to come and then later on, I, mean, I think the membership is far away. I mean, you know, for membership... Then very quickly, to last say. words. Elections. Is that is that the way out and for that? But even for that, we are still quite a distance away from having them kind of an elections in that country. No, elections are possible. Elections should be held. The question will be about uh, under which administration, right. where all will it be held? Because right now, for example, in Crimea, Crimea. there seems to be a separate uh, administration. So these are logistics that have to be uh, discussed. I also think, I mean, just to add a couple of points. One is that uh, it is between the U.S. and Russia probably to a large extent, but I think Germany will play a very important role in uh, uh, what is going to be the outcome in Ukraine. What about uh, China? Ukraine. China will be in the background. China is not a player. I mean, he is a player, but he's not going to be in the forefront in resolving this issue at this point. Uh, the second thing is, I think, the losses, I mean, we've discussed all this, but there is a strong public opinion even within Russia. So Putin has to play to it also. He has to keep that in mind. He doesn't want his own regime to be rocked Rock from in, the, in the uh, right or left. And so therefore, I think he's given up on the Eurasian project per se. But if he uh, gets assurances, as Master Sen has pointed out, that there will be no NATO expansion into Ukraine, 
that the Russians will be able to continue with their base in Crimea for till at least 2042. And if the protect the minorities, Russian speaking, not minorities, okay. Russian speaking people are protected, then I think there is a case for compromise. <laughs> there seems to be many solutions to it, but whether the two countries will be able to come to a solution, we'll wait and watch. Things are very tense, but as uh, Uday Baskar pointed out, that you know that that the two leaders, the U.S. and the American presidents, are talking to each other itself is some uh, hope. We can see there. Thanks to all my guests, Uday Baskar, Mr. Ronan Sain, Gulshan Sachdeva, and Nandan Unikrishnan. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue in Big Picture same time tomorrow.